For when ships collide at sea and lives are lost, there must be an accounting. Responsibility must be fixed. These are hard facts, but the rules men who go to sea live by can be no less hard than the sea itself. Tuesday, June 3rd, 1969. A combined naval force is steaming in the South China Sea during a CETO exercise codenamed Sea Spirit. At the center of the formation is HMAS Melbourne, an Australian anti-submarine aircraft carrier. Screening Melbourne, patrolling in a sector, are five destroyers, the USS Frank E. Evans, HMNZS Blackpool, HMS Cleopatra, USS Keys, and USS Larson. The officer in tactical command of the formation is aboard Melbourne. The formation is on a base course of 220, speed 18 knots, and is zigzagging in accordance with a plan in the exercise operation order. All units in the formation are steaming at darkened ship with no navigational lights showing. The sea is glassy and the wind calm. Visibility is unrestricted in bright moonlight and scattered clouds. Lieutenant J.G. David R. Burton comes up to relieve the deck at approximately 2345 on June 2nd. His J.O.O.D. is Lieutenant J.G. John Reynolds. Burton has been on board Evans for almost two years and has been standing O.O.D. watches for several months. The screen commander has designated Evans rescue destroyer for flight operations. Three times during the previous hours between 1800 and 2300, Evans has been ordered from her screening position to plane guard a thousand yards astern of Melbourne. Screen to Melbourne, is a guide in the center. Okay. 21 knots, uh, no other active contacts. Next contact will be uh, stunt golf. Ready to relieve you. Ready to relieve you. We've got uh, the Melbourne down here in the center. The Keys, Larson's, Cleopatra, Blackpool, and we're down the bottom. The captain's night orders, which contain the commanding officer's instructions for watch standing, have been prepared and sent to the bridge. All officers standing deck and CIC watches must read and initial them. Tonight, the orders state the CO is to be called for all changes in the formation, but not for course and speed changes used in patrolling station. Melbourne will resume flight operations at 0330, but that fact is not mentioned in the night orders. The CO, Commander Philip C. Mitchell, is in his sea cabin preparing to retire for the night. I relieve you, sir. I stand relieved. This is Lieutenant J.G. Burton. I have the deck and the con. Aye, sir. Aye, sir. My rudder is right 10 degrees coming to course 285. The first hours of the watch are fast-paced. The OTC stops and restarts the zigzag plan several times. Increase your rudder to right standard. Increase my rudder to right standard. Aye, aye, sir. Evans is applying constant rudder and frequent speed changes to remain on station and patrol her sector. Indicate turns for 21 knots. Indicate turns for 21 knots. Aye, aye, sir. At about 0230, Lieutenant J.G. Burton turns the con over to his J.O.O.D. Hey, How about driving for a while? I want to check the message traffic. Uh, we're on 270 at 21 knots. Just be sure to... At the time Lieutenant J.G. Reynolds assumes the con, the formation has temporarily stopped zigzagging. This is Lieutenant J.G. Reynolds. I have the con. At 0253, the OTC orders the formation to turn left to course 185. 
two minutes later, he orders resumption of zigzagging. Lieutenant J.G. Reynolds mistakes the 185 course just ordered for the base course of the zigzag plan. While the duty of the OOD is to supervise and assist the other members of his watch team and to ensure the conning officer knows the base course and speed of the formation, Lieutenant J.G. Burton does not correct Mr. Reynolds' mistaken assumption. The time is now 0308. In one minute, Evans will receive a message directing her to assume rescue destroyer station astern of Melbourne. The events leading to disaster are about to begin. At this time, Evans is out of station and in Blackpool's sector. This places her off the port bow of Melbourne, which is steaming on course 260, the current leg of the zigzag plan. Reynolds believes Evans is directly ahead of Melbourne or to starboard. Moreover, he believes the carrier is on course 205. The time, just before 0309. The next leg of the zigzag for the carrier is left to 240. Melbourne will not execute that turn, for she is about to alter the formation. Charlie 1, this is Juliet 3. Execute to follow. Formation 1. Call sign Mike 3. Call sign Bravo 4. Break. Bravo 4. Over. Uh, this is Bravo 4. Roger out. Contrary to the captain's night orders that he be called for changes in station, he is not informed of the signal telling Evans to take rescue destroyer station. The time? 0310. Charlie 1, this is Juliet 3. Stand by. Execute. Break. Bravo 4, over. Bravo 4, roger out. Right 10 degrees, roger. Right 10 degrees, roger, right? Very well. Because Reynolds thinks he is dead ahead or to starboard of Melbourne, he chooses a right turn to station. Were the carrier to make a left turn to the next zigzag leg, the range would open further and Evans would pass safely down Melbourne's starboard side to her station astern of the carrier. He's too close for a maneuvering board solution. We'll have to eyeball her in. Evans' actual position makes the starboard turn a dangerous maneuver. She is turning into the carrier. Melbourne, which had previously collided with an Australian destroyer in 1964, has given the screening ships in the present formation instructions always to turn away from the carrier when taking station. For added safety, she positions rescue destroyers behind her before turning to her course for flight operations. This allows the destroyer to follow in the carrier's wake as she turns into the wind. Passing 310, sir. Very well. Evan's slow, wide turn in front of the carrier is causing concern on the bridge of Melbourne. In order to alert Evans to the danger, Melbourne's captain sends in code his course of 260. Bravo 4, this is Mike 3. Mike Corpin, shackle. Zulu, uniform. Uniform, Lima. Unshackle. Break. Time, 0312. Over. Bravo 4, roger out. Pass 000, sir. Very well. Steady on new course, 050. Steady new course, 050, sir. Melbourne's coming around to 160. Lieutenant J.G. Burton incorrectly decodes 260 as 160 and misinterprets the Mike Corpin signal to mean that Melbourne is coming to that course. The time? 0313 plus. Anxiety increases on Melbourne's bridge as Evans continues its right turn into the carrier. The captain orders Melbourne's navigational lights turned on to full brilliance and sends a stronger warning to Evans. Bravo 4, this is Mike 3. You're on a collision course. Over. Sir, I am studying a new course, 050. Very well. 
Hey, I don't get those lights. Is she launching aircraft? What the hell? That's a poor running light. What's her bearing drift? I hold her drifting left. Left five degrees rudder. The time, still, 0313 plus. A collision can still be avoided. Evans, with five degrees left rudder on, would narrowly miss Melbourne. In a few moments, both ships will commit to turns that will make the tragedy inevitable. Boy, something's wrong here. Something's very wrong. She should be coming to 160. The commanding officer of Evans remains asleep in his sea cabin. He has received no indication that his ship is in harm's way. Melbourne's captain, having heard no response to his earlier warning, repeats it. Bravo 4, this is Mike 3. You're on a collision course. Over. Right full rudder. Bravo 4, roger. My rudder is right full. She says we're on a collision course, but I don't get it. She must mean she hasn't executed her turn to 160. Right rudder on. We'll pass under her stern, but it'll be close. The time, still 0314 plus. There is one last message from Melbourne. It confirms action already taken by Melbourne's commanding officer. Action that makes collision inevitable. Bravo 4, this is Mike 3. I'm going hard left. Over. At the time of Evans' final hard right rudder and Melbourne's hard left, there were nine possible combinations of turns available to the two ships. Even up to those final moments, if any of seven other combinations had been chosen, the collision would have been avoided. Melbourne signals she is altering course to the left. Collision is seconds away. There are still desperate attempts being made on both ships to avoid it. Melbourne's captain orders all engines stop. Almost simultaneously, the Melbourne officer of the watch orders all engines back. The engines will not respond to the last order until after the collision. God, she's going to hit us. All engines back full. At about 0315 on June 3rd, 1969, Melbourne strikes the port side of Evans at frame 92, the approximate location of CIC. The angle between the ships at impact is about 90 degrees. Evans is split into two sections. The force of the collision stops Melbourne dead in the water. The entire watch in Evans CIC is lost. No one in the forward fire room or the IC plotting room survives. Of the 10 officers in the forward section, four of them, the CO, XO, and the two deck watch officers survive. 33 of the 101 enlisted men escape. Evans' forward section rolls 90 degrees to starboard and does not recover as it passes down the port side of Melbourne. In nine minutes, it sinks in 1,100 fathoms of water, taking 73 men to the bottom. One additional body is picked up by a lifeboat. In the Evans' junior officer compartment in the forward section, a ladder not bolted properly to the deck rises up as the section rolls. The ladder blocks all escape and all the officers in the compartment are lost. Through various acts of heroism, others in the forward section of Evans are saved. The BMOW seaman James Barnes, after being thrown from Evans Bridge to the water by the collision, 
swims back to the forward section. After climbing aboard, Seaman Barnes forces open a door leading from the main deck. It is now horizontal because the section is lying on its starboard side. He then shouts to those inside that this is the way out. Sixteen men escape through the door that Seaman Barnes has opened. In a tragic irony, his brother remains trapped in a compartment below and is lost. The aft section of Evans, which rights itself after an initial roll to starboard, floats down the right side of Melbourne and comes to rest off the carrier's starboard quarter. Here, too, many officers and men respond with valor. Lieutenant M.L. Bradshaw, Evans' operations officer, is the senior officer in the aft section. He assembles the crew on the fantail and organizes the distribution of life jackets. Only after ordering the evacuation of the rest of the Evans crew does Lieutenant Bradshaw himself leave what remains of his ship. Signalman First Class Robert Simpson and Quartermaster Second Class Peter Jones go through the berthing compartments in the after section, ordering the men to the fantail. After searching to ensure that no one remains, they pass through the compartments, setting condition zebra. Other petty officers help calm the crew and supervise the evacuation to Melbourne by a ladder, scrambling nets, and Jacob's ladder when the aft section of Evans has been secured to the carrier. The search for Evans survivors continues through daylight of June 3rd. Helicopters from Melbourne and USS Kearsarge, as well as boats from the Australian carrier, cooperate in the search. The last survivor is picked up by Hilo at 0340. Later in the day, Evans survivors are transferred to Kearsarge. A number are injured. All personnel, with the exception of one fireman who was on watch in Evans' forward engine room at the time of the collision, require hospitalization for first and second degree burns caused by high temperature steam escaping from the broken main steam line. There are other injuries in addition to the physical wounds. Souls are scarred by the memory of being pitched to the deck by the collision, of crawling and sometimes swimming to safety through the dark and canted passageways of a broken and dying ship. It's impossible to grasp the horror of those moments. We can imagine, though, the force of the collision that caused them. We can see the physical evidence. The effects are devastating when two ships are brought together at a relative speed of 30 knots. Seaman Jose Rosa was on top of Evans' signal shelter when she was struck. The force of the collision whipped him through the air up and onto the carrier's flight deck. Seaman Rosa suffered multiple injuries but survived. The force of the Melbourne Evans collision also ripped away sections of the destroyer and tossed them onto the flight deck of Melbourne. The survivors from Evans are now safe. Cleanup of Melbourne is almost complete. The job of winding up other details of the Melbourne Evans disaster will not be so easy. For when ships collide at sea and lives are lost, there must be an accounting. Responsibility must be fixed. These are hard facts, but the rules men who go to sea live by can be no less hard than the sea itself. On June 10, 1969, a joint board of investigation presided over by Rear Admiral Jerome H. King, Jr., senior member, convened at the U.S. Naval Station, Subic Bay, the Philippines. The board found that Evans was primarily responsible for the collision as Evans had the duty to remain clear of Melbourne in taking station. The board further fixed individual responsibility for the collision among the officers on USS Evans. It found that Lieutenant J.G. Reynolds was the conning officer from the time of the signal to take station astern of Melbourne to the time Lieutenant J.G. Burton automatically assumed the con by ordering right full rudder. As such, Lieutenant J.G. Reynolds 
was responsible for the orders which placed Evans on a collision course with Melbourne. His later order of a left turn was sufficient to relieve, but not to eliminate, the hazard in which he placed both ships. The board found that Lieutenant J.G. Reynolds did not exercise due care, which contributed to the collision by... Right, 10 degrees, Rudder. Right, 10 degrees, Rudder. Right, right. Failing to ascertain correctly Evans' position relative to Melbourne before turning, and by failing to keep track of Melbourne's movements relative to Evans after the maneuver began. This would have revealed to him that he was on a collision course. By failing to request information from the Combat Information Center. Left five degrees, Rudder. And by failing to make a more decisive turn to the left, which would have eliminated all hazard to both ships. In the case of Lieutenant J.G. Burton, the board found that as officer of the deck, he was personally responsible for the conning actions taken by Lieutenant J.G. Reynolds and found Lieutenant J.G. Burton equally responsible for conning Evans into a collision course with Melbourne as well as the subsequent left turn. Left eyeball or in. Right full rudder. By ordering right full rudder, Lieutenant J.G. Burton assumed sole responsibility for conning Evans. The board pointed out that Lieutenant J.G. Burton, as officer of the deck, was the officer on watch in charge of the ship and primarily responsible for the safe navigation of the ship. The basic responsibility for the collision flows from the manner in which Lieutenant J.G. Burton discharged his duties as OOD. According to the watch officer's guide, the OOD, when another officer has the con, should assist in the maneuvers by checking the performance of the bridge watch keeping a watchful eye on the entire maneuver in order to inform the conning officer of anything which might escape his notice and consequently might endanger the ship. This two-intellect system serves as a check to prevent accidents arising from confusion, lapse of memory, or oversight on the part of the person conning. Bravo 4, Roger out. Right. The board found that Lieutenant J.G. Burton failed to ensure that the conning officer knew the formation's base course and Melbourne's course before turning, and that he failed to determine correctly Evans' position relative to Melbourne prior to the turn. That he failed to request information from the Combat Information Center. That he failed to keep track of Melbourne's movements relative to Evans, which would have revealed that he was on a collision course that he failed to call the commanding officer of Evans, as was required. That Burton failed to make a more decisive turn to the left, which would have eliminated all hazard to both ships. And that he failed to decode Melbourne's Corpin signal correctly. Unshackled. Break. Time. Zero three. One two. Over. The board found that Commander Mitchell adequately discharged all his responsibilities as commanding officer of Evans. However, the board also recognized that a commanding officer has inherent accountability for his ship and absolute responsibility for her actions. On September 3, 1969, Commander 7th Fleet awarded Lieutenant J.G. Reynolds a letter of reprimand as punishment under Article 15, Uniform Code of Military Justice. On September 11, 1969, before a general court-martial convened by Commander 7th Fleet at Subic Bay, Lieutenant J.G. Burton entered a guilty plea to charges of dereliction of duty and of negligently hazarding a vessel. He was sentenced to be reprimanded and to lose 1,000 numbers of the unrestricted line. On September 16, 1969, Commander Mitchell who had entered a plea of not guilty, was found by a general court-martial to be guilty of dereliction of duty and negligently hazarding a vessel. He was sentenced to be reprimanded. If anything is to be learned from a tragedy such as the Melbourne-Evans collision, it is not enough to simply recount all the things that were done wrong or neglected. We should review and emphasize the correct way to prepare adequately for assuming a deck watch and the proper way to conduct the watch once you have uttered those words, 
I relieve you, sir. The relieving watch should be on station in sufficient time to become familiar with equipment conditions and the overall situation and still relieve on time. A trip to CIC is essential in order to get the full tactical picture, a fix on the position of other ships in the area, any planned maneuvers of the formation, and also to get a feel for the tempo of operations. Our course is uh, 220 at 18 knots. We have one contact, 310, 10,000 yards. CPA of 030 at 4,000 yards. Uh, time of CPA is 2355, designated Skunk Gulf. When the relieving officers reach the bridge, a review of the tactical situation is repeated. This process reinforces the picture in the minds of the OOD and the JOOD who are relieving the watch and helps them absorb the rapid flow of many facts and items of information. It also double checks the accuracy of information, ensuring the pictures in combat and on the bridge conform. Prior to assuming the watch, all messages received since the last period of watch standing should be read and understood. The captain's night orders should also be read carefully and initialed when fully understood. Through briefings from their counterparts, the relieving OOD and JOOD should be made fully aware of everything concerning the status of their ship and the tactical situation. Two boilers on the line, number one and number four. Number one and number two, ship service generators with a split plant. Information passed from one watch to the next should include the following. The condition of readiness and materiel condition set. The status of lookouts. Which boilers are in use. Anticipated speed changes. Reserve speed available and maximum speed requirements. Navigational equipment such as Loran, radar, or fathometer in use. Important events scheduled during the watch. The course and speed of the ship and its position in the formation. Finally, both the OOD and the oncoming JOOD should check personally the position of the guide to be certain their ship is on station before they relieve the watch. Bridge combat. Combat recommends course 048, 22 knots to station. The close cooperation between the deck watch and CIC should always be continued throughout the watch period. The OOD, as the officer on watch in charge of the ship, must remain constantly alert. He must demand the same performance from other members of his watch team and stand ready to assist them. Coming around too slow, put on full rudder. Increase your rudder to right full. Whenever a situation arises, which, according to the night orders or standing orders, requires a call to the captain, the OOD should make the call immediately. If an OOD is in doubt about whether a situation requires calling the captain, that doubt alone is a signal to him to make captain, the call. The the deck, uh, we have a signal in the air from the OTC. When you have completed all procedures for assuming the watch and are prepared to follow strictly the proper practices of watch standing, then, and only then, are you ready to say, I relieve you, sir, and assume the responsibilities that go with those words. This film contains a factual recreation of the Melbourne-Evans collision. The names of the principal officers on the Evans were changed.